Hi, everyone. I am Tina. I am a VP of Product and Engineering here at Harness. Thank you, everyone, for joining today for this keynote. But before I was at Harness, I've spent the majority of my career as a software engineer. And as part of that, I have had to operate law from lots of different services. One of my early jobs was actually at Google, and this was around 2005. SRE was really in its infancy, and very few teams and engineering teams had support of SRE. And back then, most teams, including mine, didn't have SREs. And so it was us as engineers. We were given physical pagers. I don't know how many of you had to experience those days. But it was also a time when there wasn't this culture around things like blameless postmortems and a culture of acceptance. You're thrown a pager, given pretty much zero preparation leading up to this. And expected when you were woken up at two in the morning, which happened to me countless times, you were just expected to figure it out. I also had the possible luxury of working at Twitter in those early fail well days. Many of you probably remember in the early days of Twitter, we were down all the time. We're not really known for resiliency. And one of the other things that's interesting is Twitter, like many companies in the 2010s, was on that bandwagon of let's microservice the world. This is the happy trend. They didn't really think about the fact that I remember at some point commenting to one of my coworkers, hey, you realize that we have pretty much as many microservices here as we have engineers to support them on the platform engineering team. So you can pretty quickly imagine how this works out. I had me and one other engineer. Together, we own two critical services, the link shortener and the notification service. And we were on call 24-7, 365 days a year. I tell you all these stories to say this really fueled a passion of mine to be to think about how can we make on-call life easier. In some ways, it was actually quite traumatic as a very junior engineer uh, being given all of these responsibilities and almost no tools to help do that job. And so all of this eventually led me to found this company called Transposit. And at Transposit, our focus is really on automation and orchestration in the early days, specifically around a lot of DevOps workflows. And then a year or two ago, it's hard to keep track of time now, when that Gen AI sort of burst onto the scene, it became a, a bit, really big interest of ours as to how can we leverage this to do AI-powered incident management. And so I spent basically a decade of my life thinking about this problem around automation, AI, incident management. And so you can imagine how this question of, is AI fundamentally changing what it means to be an SRE? Or is it more like a natural evolution from where we've always been? This question is really near and dear to my heart. Before I keep going, I'd like to ask you all a few questions. How many of you use AI pretty much every day in your life? I'm definitely one of those people. I cannot live, please never take ChatGPT away from me again. How many of you use AI every, every day for an SRE function? Yeah, a lot, lot more limited. Okay. How many of you feel that AI is inherently limited and can't really be useful for SRE? Okay, that's good. We have a lot of uh, optimists out there. That's, that's good to know. And how many of you are a little bit fearful that AI might take your job one day? One of those hands went up even before I finished the question. Okay. <laughs> Internally, we had someone post to Slack, one of those Slack channels fairly recently, and they asked, how many of you, for it was to a set of engineering managers, how many of you have had positive experiences with GitHub Copilot? And part of what fueled this was that they had been hearing very mixed. Leading up to this keynote, I decided to do a little bit of research and be like, okay, how much is this also true of AI and SRE? And I was fortunate enough to find this Reddit post that pretty much answered exactly my question. It was titled, The Role of AI and SRE, Hype or Game Changer? And so here you can see quite a bit of mixed reviews, everything from it is a solution looking for a problem. There's some people who are more hopeful around AI potentially helping take away some of that minutia in your job, and then other people who are, are pretty bullish on it. And I think you see this a lot from anecdotally talking to anyone about who's in this industry and thought a lot about AI. And so I started to think about how much, like, why do we have such a spectrum of attitudes, right, when looking at this? And I think 
a lot of it, at least one of my hypotheses is, is the attitude and the approach of how people go about evaluating new tools and technologies that potentially leads to a very divergent set of results. And so one way that I thought about pushing this hypothesis a little bit further is let's think about how engineers evaluate other engineers, right? And because that's very analogous to how you might evaluate AI. And luckily, this is something that we do on a day-to-day, not day-to-day basis, but do it regularly. It's through job interviews. We do technical job interviews. So I started thinking about, okay, what have I observed, both as someone who's gone through a number of technical interviews and also been on the hiring side? And broadly speaking, I'd say you can categorize these into two different buckets, right? The first bucket is something that I call the gotcha style interview. So I suspect most of you have unfortunately been subjected to one of these interviews. And this is when it almost feels like the interviewer's they believe it's their duty to prove that you are not good enough for this job, right? One of the unfortunate things about this style of interview is you can actually take the best SRE out there, right? And given the right interview, you could probably fail them. The other unfortunate reason uh, for the style of interview is I honestly don't think it's very reflective of what, it, what the job is as an, S, as an SRE or an engineer, right? Um, Rarely is your job to be able to do everything all at once. Especially for a role like SRE, your job probably looks a lot more like this. So here you see an image of a swarm of bees, right? And I don't know how many of you use the same terminology, but when we talk to different people about SRE, they often use the terminology incident swarms, right? It's a swarming behavior that you do. You get together in a war room and different people have different functions, right? Uh, You have some people who maybe are busy coming up with new hypotheses for what might be going wrong. You have other people who are drilling in and investigating and diving deep into a a bunch of different possibilities. Uh, You might have another set of people who are busy um, talking and sharing the uh, communications with other uh, teams and and to customers. So knowing that this is the the day-to-day of what it means to be an SRE, I think a much better approach in the second bucket of interviews looks a little bit more like this. So in this version of the interview, what you're doing is you're trying to figure out from the interviewee, what are your strengths, right? You're looking to extract out of them areas of value. And here, you can then combine that with what does my team look like, right? What are the holes and the gaps that I might be trying to fill? And can I have that match? One of the ways I think about this is with any good partnership, it shouldn't be one plus one equals two. It should be one plus one equals three. So if you apply this to AI, then you can really think about it as the question shouldn't be, is AI going to replace an SRE? SRE, our mandate is really about how do you improve reliability of services, right? So it should really be more, I'm going to interview the AI and evaluate it on Can AI help me and my team have better reliability? So let's take a moment to talk about one of the core and foundational principles of SRE, which is automation. So I've spent a lot of time talking to SREs, people on DevOps, cloud engineers about automation. And one of the the things that constantly comes up is this idea of a fear of automation. And so what do I mean by that? Especially when you talk about very dynamic environments like incidents, there's a general belief that thing, every incident is different, right? Um, and at some point, the automation, using traditional and classical ways of automating uh, that are pretty rigid and role-based, you end up, by the time you codify all the different edge cases out there, you end up with an automation that's incredibly fragile and potentially takes up more time to debug the automation itself than to debug the actual problems that you're trying to solve. And so I've spent years advocating that the solution to this, uh, especially for the incident response space, is something that I like to call human-in-the-loop automation. And so with human-in-the-loop automation, the idea is keep the automations simple. 
And then let humans act as that glue, right? Let them use their human judgment and take away all of the complexities. And then those humans can now hand execute the automations on demand. And so in that way, you get a little bit of the best of both worlds. So one of the really exciting capabilities in my mind about LLMs, and I don't know for this audience how many of you have dug into this, but one of the most exciting capabilities in my mind is this thing that is called tool calling. And so for those of you who are not familiar, tool calling is where you effectively pass in the function definition of what your tools are. So that's a little bit like the description of what the tool does. This is the schema and what the inputs look like. This is what the outputs are. And you can pass that into the prompt for the LLM. And the LLM can help make decisions as to what tool is appropriate to call and how to call it. So if you think about this a little bit, what that effectively has created is this idea of AI in the loop automation, right? Um, now we have almost this dynamic form of automation where AI can do some level of reasoning, and then call these external tools for you. But human in the loop and AI in the loop automation, they don't have to be mutually exclusive, right? I think the ideal world is something that looks a little bit more like human in the loop and AI in the loop automation um, all bridged together. So I challenge all of you as you think about AI and how to incorporate AI into your jobs today to really not do this gotcha-style interviews towards AI. Uh, too often, I see people have a very specific task that they want done, and then they effectively test the AI on it. And the second the AI makes even the smallest of mistakes, they're like, AI is not good enough, right? AI is never going to replace humans. And honestly, this just isn't the right attitude. You should really be thinking about what are the strengths that the new uh, types of AI are bringing in, and how can I leverage those uh, to augment my team? So I want to talk about some concrete use cases here. And I intentionally try to create a diversity of examples to talk about a, different, a diverse set of generative AI techniques in case some of you aren't familiar with all of them. So the first one is alert triage. And here, I, I really like this use case because it's a great example of an agentic style workflow. And so what does that really mean? So I think at the core to be agentic, there's three pieces to it. The first one is the agent has to be able to use LLMs to leverage some sort of reasoning and thought. The second thing that makes it an agent is it has the ability to take action, right? So do call outs. The very simplest of this and what integrated into a lot of products like ChatGBT is the ability to do an external search. And then the third part is it has to basically operate in a loop, right? So that is continuing to feed back into itself to come up with a conclusion. So I'll give you a very simple example of this. Imagine an alert that comes into your system that is high 500s on your app server. HTTP error codes are a well-known domain. And so what this looks like is imagine prompting an LLM like ChatGPT with, hey, what would I do on this alert? And it's, oh, 500s, probably go find some exceptions. Now think back to what we talked about a little bit earlier in this conversation around tool calling. And so imagine you have a bunch of pre-configured tools. Maybe one of those tools is a call out to Splunk to get your logs, maybe your exception tracer. And so now you can follow on and the agent can say, hey, what tool and how do I want to call it to get more information? And then after it does that API call out to something like Splunk, take those log messages, synthesize, repeat. And the outcome of these agents doesn't even have to be that it's able to remediate and solve everything all at once. It could just be even additional context for that on-call engineer. The second use case here is one that I find personally very entertaining is request routing. I don't know how many of you have ever witnessed or observed a sort of bureaucratic ticketing process evolve. But you can have a small company and it begins with something very simple, right? People message the on-call channel and say, hey, here on this URL, I'm having an, an error, right? And this is what it looks like. And then the engineer jumps on and they say, hey, can you tell me 
what environment this is, is it affecting customers, who are those customers, etc. Then one day, a uh, product manager is, aha, I can solve this. I'm going to create a ticket. The ticket is going to have some required fields. It's going to be environment, customers, etc. They keep adding to this ticket. And before you know it, you have a ticket with 30 fields that you have to fill out to report a problem. Half of them are required. No one can make heads or tails of how to fill out this ticket. Problem solved. I will create a wiki page. I will create a wiki page that's going to tell you how you're going to fill out this ticket to report your problem. This is a perfect example of where LLMs can help us, right? One of the ways I think about LLMs is they are incredibly good at taking large amounts of unstructured data and deriving structure out of it. And so if you also lump into that, that you pass in specific context around your environment, the LLM can probably take from a URL, figure out that subdomain, that means staging, right? Or that means production. It can automatically try to fill out as much of the required information as possible and then ask appropriate follow-up conversations to get to that. And so you can imagine how this would be a much, much better user experience for routing than what we have today. The third example here that I have is called incident, is around, I called it instance similarity, but this is really any sort of similarity. So for those of you who don't know what embeddings are, Embeddings are a way of encoding large amounts of information into a vector. And traditionally, with traditional ML techniques, these vectors, there's a lot of data scientists that were busy trying to figure out exactly what features to use in the vector. But where LLMs have had a major breakthrough is they allow us to produce incredibly high-quality, context-aware embeddings. And they do these with these very large models that have billions of different feature features on the vector. So if you take it, apply it to something like incidents, suddenly you're able to do incident similarity, not off of these high level features of an incident, but you're able to take all of that context, right? The discussions that are going on in an incident, potentially logs that get shared in the incident channels, graphs, dashboards, et cetera. And all of that can be encoded to help you derive incident similarity. And then once you have the notion of incident similarity, the sky's the limit. Because once you're able to say and easily figure out what incidents are like the one I'm seeing right now, you're able to then easily imagine answering questions like, who helped solve this incident last time it was seen? What dashboards did people look at? What were the obvious remediation steps, et cetera? The next one here is a build on top of this notion of embeddings, right? And broadly speaking, it's called, I call it knowledge-based search. For those of you who aren't familiar with this technique, it's called, there's something called retrieval augmented generation, often known as RAG. One of the failure points of LLMs, or it's not even a failure, it's a limitation, is that LLMs are trained on generally available knowledge out of the box, they don't necessarily know the specifics of your organization or how it operates. And so the way that people have worked around this is through a technique where they take all of your information locally and they encode it using embeddings. And when you ask a question, you're able to find relevant documents and then pass all of that as context into the LLM to be able to better answer your question. The next one here is around hypothesis generation. So one of the, the things that people harped on a lot as generative AI was coming out is that a lot of uh, AI tends to hallucinate and be inaccurate. And it's almost in the name, right? The generative AI right, is synthesizing, uh, coming up with new ideas. And so I think some of the best use cases for this form of AI is when there's a little bit of creativity involved, right? You don't need the exact answer and it's not right or wrong. So even think about this without AI and think about an incident swarm with a bunch of humans. You don't need every person and their hypothesis as to what might be causing your incident to be right. In fact, most of the time, you're not, right? Only the person who ultimately figures out the, the root cause has the right hypothesis. And so here, it's actually beneficial to have additional teammates that might be able to 
come up with ideas that you did not think of. And then especially if you're able to do an investigation and ultimately prove if it's right or wrong, then that, that's great, right? And the final example here that I want to touch on is around summarization. And I'm going to go back to that alerting example. This happened to me even when I was running Transposit. I was not day-to-day on call. And, and I think anyone who's on call is like you're on call once every couple months. And so it's a pretty common experience where you see an alert that you don't know what to And so for us, we had all of our alerts go to Slack, and then people would have discussions about triaging that alert in Slack threads. And so what's the first thing you do? Go find some similar alerts to what you're seeing and figure out what people previously did. So for something like alerts, uh, you don't even need AI necessarily to find similar alerts. Uh, Alerts are generated by machines, and so you can pretty much deduce that just with general automation. Now, AI can help you there. But even after you've found the similar alerts, it can be incredibly time-consuming reading the, the threads of 80 or 100 messages to figure out what actually happened. I always joke that with any one of those threads, there's someone who is also, oh, sorry, taking my dog out for a walk and a side conversation about what you're having for dinner. And so when you think about these use cases, you can really leverage AI as a superpower to help you sift through all of that data and give you the appropriate context. This is the reality today. I don't need to tell any of you, but SREs are facing just an unprecedented amount of burnout. I think a lot of this is rooted in the fact that anytime you ask humans to do a lot of rote, repeatable tasks that can be done by machines, it's a bit dehumanizing. And so I'm pretty bullish on AI and the, 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 the version of it where AI actually allows us to bring a lot more humanity into the day-to-day of an SRE. And that's all I have for you, everyone. Um, thanks for listening to my talk and uh, open for questions. Any questions? Oh, of course. All the way back there. Uh, I started the recording. Gotcha. It's going to be a quick question. I saw a lot of people taking pictures of that particular slide with the six things on there. Are you going to be sharing that out after we're done here? More than happy to. That, that one was easy. All right. Who's, who's next for questions? There we go. You mentioned using embeddings to find incident similarity. Right? How do you try? Like, how does it, how is the performance better compared to using general and clustered? Clustering, right? Because essentially you're trying to find patterns within incident. Uh, is it much better? And compared to like, you'll incur some cost to the LLMs, right? And if your alert volumes are high. So uh, yeah, maybe first, what was the performance improvement if you've tried that? And mm-hmm. what was the cost incurred? I think it's, first off, it's not really an apples to apples comparison. Um, because even the idea of searching for similar incidents, I think in many organizations, they don't actually have a structured output that you could do a traditional search on, right? At best, you have a bunch of Slack or Microsoft Teams channels with the communication. And so the search is really a needle in the haystack in that case to find the relevant information that you need. With regard to cost, one of the costs of embeddings, one, is actually not that expensive to create the embeddings. But the majority of the cost is at the creation time. So it's when you're encoding up the embedding for the incident. When you're actually finding, doing the similarity search, it's just math, right? At that point, you have all of your embeddings in something like a vector DB. And so it's very cheap and fast to to do the similarity matches. Okay, so to clarify the first part, I didn't mean search like anything like support vector machine, which can classify incidents, right? If you are implementing a system for incident classification, you can as well do like traditional machine learning rather than LLMs, right? So why LLMs? I think that's the question. Did you see any performance improvement compared to that? Yeah, I think that the reason why the traditional model, as far as I know, I have not run across any companies to do this. The traditional model is you're training up a, a model from scratch, right? And so you have to have a bunch of your own incident data and then feed it in to train and give that understanding. And I don't know of any company, uh, I don't know if anyone here can has done this, but I don't know of any company who has taken the time to train. It's, there's also with incidents, not enough data to particularly be helpful there. I have also another question. You previously talked about tool calling. Usually when troubleshooting, a human or engineer needs to do multiple jumps 
uh, in order to come up with the right conclusion. So I imagine like an LLM needs to take multiple tool calls and then uh, concludes based on the output. So how do you imagine or vision this happening? Like how do you imagine like taking our organizational data and allowing the LLM to to do that really? Yeah, so that's where I said part of the agentic piece is, involves having a loop, right? So it doesn't all have to happen in one step similar to a human. The agent can decide, okay, I'm going to go fetch some graphs or metrics and then reason about that and then figure out what's the next chain of thought that I want to do from there. So I think it operates very similar to a human in that sense. All right, go. Time for one last question. Any last questions? All right. Thank you very much, Jihan.